What's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. So it's about halfway through our season, February 12th. Um, I've been through eight riding clinics. I've had seven or eight avalanche courses and then a ton of riding in between. So we've put quite a few miles on my guide sled and today I think we're going to go through a mid-season checkup. Let's get into it. So beyond, and those of you guys that know me, or even if you don't know me, and you've seen videos or pictures of the shop, I'm a pretty OCD guy. So doing what I'm doing right now is a pretty common thing, just keeping sleds looking their best to feel like when a sled looks good and you take care of it, it's gonna take care of you in the backcountry. So beyond just the overall, like where you just, you just look at the sled, just go over it. You're looking for some obvious things. Um, I do like cleaning it up, um, but I also like having a, an opportunity where it's not every day that I pull the panels off and like really inspect the entire engine bay area. And that's what we're going to do today. So we're going to take the side panels off, the hood off, and just take a deep dive on what's been happening inside. hardly ever talk about the side panels or the hood once we pull them off and I would just tell you that and I know that there's been videos out there before talking about the foam and the things that are on the inside of our panels especially for those that don't well you know bring their sleds back my snowmobiles lead the the easiest life on the planet they come in they get thawed out each and every day know that the the foam the things that Polaris has got to put inside of the panels onto the hood uh, some of that will hold water like crazy and so you can see that it's pretty messy it doesn't come out that clean but i've actually removed the foam from the side panels they'll do that for noise right they do that so that the engine noise is somewhat insulated but i would tell you that your side panels not unlike your seat over the over time over the course of your season can actually end up holding a bunch of moisture and just adding weight and so you're just carrying that weight every day that you're riding so quick inspection of that uh, as it does load with water, um, I've just removed it and like literally rang it out. And so I get rid of some of that stuff. I know players has to do what they have to do, but when we're trying to keep sleds nice and light, I don't hate the idea of taking some of that and removing it out of there. Um, on the hood, I don't get too banana shape about it. There's not that many areas there that it mattered. But the reason I wanted to kind of look at the back of the hood is just to look for any kind of cracks or fatigue. Uh, something like that, wires are getting too close to the pipe, something like that. A common one is this spot right in here, this plastic tab that holds essentially the entire headlight assembly. The headlight assembly is like four pounds, and so when that, if that were to take a pretty big impact um, in a rollover or even just a really hard like jump or just a jolt of it and that was broken, what I would tell you is when that does happen, that whole headlight assembly likes to kind of lay down um, you'll end up putting stress onto the heat shield of your pipe and just making things, well, not look the way they should. So I would just do an overall inspection of the inside of your hood and make sure that there's nothing out of the ordinary. And if you can make fixes through that area, doesn't mean full replacement sometimes. It might just be drilling a couple holes with a zip tie stitch, something like that. But after inspecting mine, it looks, uh, it looks pretty good. So I guess I've gotten lucky so far. So along with that, you know, typically before I, I mean, I'll clean the outside because I always do, but before I really start to dive into cleaning clutches and, and just overall inspection, a lot of this I'm just doing visually. So I'm just, I've got good light in here. If you didn't have good light, using your phone, using a, a mag light, something where you can get some good bright light into the engine bay, in and around your belt system, in and around your exhaust. Keep in mind that another good test would be the tilt test of before obviously you put a sled up on its stands, just having the hood and the side panels off and tipping the sled and kind of racking it one direction or the other, whether you've done work to the sled, whether your dealer's done work to the sled, anything like that, those are the circumstances typically when you'll hear or maybe even see something that's loose laying around in there. Could it be a, an end of a zip tie or something like that? I would tell you that just the way luck would have it, it typically ends up over on this side of the snowmobile 
and we haven't seen a belt drive issue in years, like 2013, I would say, maybe when we'd have some of those problems. Uh, I haven't gone through a belt drive since, since that time frame, um, and it's been, it's been awesome, right? We've definitely figured it out, but we have seen some of those fails because of something getting caught in between those areas, and to be honest with you guys, in terms of luck, when you do have a spring break off and that's where it ends, that's a bummer. But if it's just overall inspection of the sled and looking for it, I would say that beyond the dealer and its responsibility, I'd say it's our responsibility as well, especially as a mid-season checkup. I can only imagine what's going on underneath the hood, especially as I'm out there you know, riding as hard as we are. And so just inspecting through those areas, kind of moving ahead onto this, making sure that <clears throat> all of the things within my belt caddy you guys will notice and you've seen that trick before i've got my clutch belt inside the caddy my spark plugs here as well as my quick quick drive belt and i've got it zip tied on on the bottom and on the top so it has no way of moving it can't actually work its way off the bottom and come over here and touch on the pipe what a great way to lose a couple hundred bucks um, so anyway, I just take care of that and then it also makes it so you can just pull your wrench out, take the whole thing out and deal with whatever uh, belts that you need or change plugs, something like that. Okay, so moving on to the clutch side of things. Again, beyond a, like a visual inspection, looking for anything underneath the primary and secondary, it's also a great access point to take a light and kind of sneak under the engine and at any time, you're worried about not seeing that using a magnet uh, and may even make magnets with a little LED on the end of it and just start to kind of swim around underneath there. You may not see it and the magnet might pick it up. And so great spot again as a checkup just to look, at, look underneath there and see if you can't find a nut, a bolt or something like that. The moment you assume, right? We know what that word does to all of us. So, um, and then getting into the clutches, obviously we can go deep dive into it. You guys have seen plenty of clutching videos. Know that we're going to still work on some clutching and tuning videos as the season goes on here. But rather than pulling off the cover, inspecting the primary spring, I would easily tell you that those are things that beyond it ever being a mid-season checkup, those are things we'd be doing just depending on how much you're riding. Know that a, a primary spring, I mean Polaris, they would tell you about every 500 miles. And I would tell you that on a 9R or on a boosted sled, it's potentially less than that. And so as you're riding day after day after day, I mean, you think about what's happening to those clutch springs. Um, I would definitely take great care in popping off the primary cover and inspecting the spring. And then obviously guys, as you put that back on, just making sure that you take great care in how you put that cover back on, whether it's aftermarket or stock. I've got a rag just cleaning up the exterior, some of the dust that's associated with these things going one million miles an hour all of the time. And then uh, rotating the clutch. And a tech tip that is just important to me is that before I even put my hands in here, I will certainly come up here and make sure that the key is off and that my kill switch is off as well before I start to rotate the snowmobile or rotate the primary clutch. Um, you guys have seen how you can primary start a sled. Well, us sitting in here rotating this thing um, in a given direction, we just wouldn't want our hands to be anywhere near it if this thing decided to fire up. So looking at the clutch going through, I'm looking at the condition of my weights. And again, there's ways that we can take an even deeper dive into those things. Know that I go through my clutches extensively, um, which is why I want the best performance out of them. And so we got to keep them clean and dialed. Um, I dig into client snowmobiles all the time and the sleds you know, running at a solid 7,700 RPM and at elevation, it's basically like they're riding a 440 and you look at the clutches, you ask them how many miles are on it and they actually haven't even really opened up the side panel to maybe just put some oil in, but holy smokes, do these things look like they have, well, been through a battle, which they are. They're going through all kinds of different, I mean, it's a heat cycle, they're getting hot, they're getting cold, they've got snow around them, they've got oil dripping on, they've got all these different things. And I would tell you guys that there, it's a wear item and that you need to prepare yourself to take the extra time. So, you know, grabbing some sort of an SOS pad, guys use emery cloth, cleaning the inside of our primary clutches, taking the belt off, belt inspection would be a good one so that we don't get out there and again, turning an okay day into a great one. Remembering that belt life, that's another wear item. We need to thoroughly inspect that. 
Because of the P22 and we have that roller bearing, we're not focused really anymore about belt tension on the 9Rs or on the boosts, but it's still worth taking a peek at our belt and just making sure that there's no glazing, there's no hairs coming off it, there's no nothing. There's gonna be people that comment on this that about belts explode inside of their snowmobiles and what a disaster, especially when the threads get caught around the primary. There's just a bunch of stuff, guys, that I mean, I get it that things happen, accidents do happen, but just visual inspection going through that, knowing that I've got a spare belt that I can access or go ahead and put on, um, and then just overall cleaning of our primary and secondary. Know that we've got a spring inside of here. We've got all kinds of things that we can undo this, some good shop time, pull off the backside, look at the helix, look at the secondary spring, look at a lot of different things that are going on inside of our clutches and guaranteed guys more information, more videos out there that dive into those specifics. For now, we're just doing some visual inspections um, and just making sure that everything is clean, there's no loose items, and there's no reason for concern. Our oil bottle. Like I said, when I open up a client sled to look at their clutches, a lot of the filth that is in and around their primary clutch through the spring, over the weights, and then I look up at the oil bottle and the oil bottle is just destroyed. It's got debris all over it, pine needles stuck in loose residual oil all over the place. You know, we're gonna use a VES Extreme Oil. You guys know, you've heard me talk about it, you've heard Chris talk about it, you've heard all of us. And this is the oil that I'm gonna put in every single snowmobile, no questions asked. Why? Because it's what's recommended and it works. And so we'll get past that part of it and just talk about overall inspection of it. The cap on our oil bottle. This thing, if not put on correctly, you can tell that it's got a gasket there at the base of that. If this thing is sitting on there and it's cross-threaded and you go roll that snowmobile over, we're gonna have a problem. And I've seen it time and time again. So just take extra care when you are filling up with oil and hopefully that's something that you're inspecting every day, not just on a mid-season checkup. Okay, so while I'm still up front of the sled, we haven't really put any wrenches on anything just yet. Still more or less just doing a visual inspection as well as a clean. I'm going through my suspension on the front end here. I'm just looking for residual oil. I'm looking for any kind of cracks, anything that's wrong with up here on the QS3. And this would be on you know, your factory walkers as well, guys. Um, I've had to send shocks uh, over to a friend of mine at Gas Shock Repair because of shocks leaking oil. Um, obviously when that happens, they, their performance goes way, way down. Um, and it's not that difficult, nor is it that expensive to have those fixes done. But anyway, you wouldn't know it if you weren't paying any attention to it. Um, suspension is easily one of the most overlooked and in my opinion, one of the most essential uh, components to a snowmobile to get that sled to perform the way you want it to perform. And so taking a look at your shocks, whether that's a every other ride, uh, certainly gonna do it as part of our mid-season checkup here. But just making sure that we don't have any cracks in and around where the mounting points are. You know, the thing has performed really, really well for me and I want it to continue doing that. So we'll just continue to look at it, make sure that all of our switches are functioning properly. Obviously with an air shock, we would wanna unweight the machine to check air pressure. That I have already done and made sure that my air pressure was in spec, both within the eval chamber as well as the main. Anyway, lots of different wrenches that are out there, but grabbing some of those and just coming through and just doing that just to everything. So all through the front suspension, making sure that again, you're not seeing any fatigues, any cracks. I was just out on a class and a guy with this little 13 millimeter nut and bolt, the nut just came off the sled. And so we're out in the back country and boom, he loses his linkage here. And we just happened to have one uh, in a toolkit, which was so awesome, kind of saved the day. And all of it could have been solved by, obviously that thing was so far out on the end of the bolt that it just fell off. So um, looking at all those things, making sure that everything is tight, come down the spindle, and then looking at the skis, uh, we can take a peek underneath, make sure that the carbides are still there. They're probably getting pretty worn out from miles down the road or just even hard snow. Uh, there's nothing bent. There's no fatigue or cracking into the grip or two here. And then the ski rubber. A lot of videos talking about ski rubbers, whether it's a stock ski rubber from Polaris, like this guy here, which is in my sled and or we've got some aftermarket ones between DuraPro and some other ones. This one just got dropped off to me from BWC Power Sports. Guys, I thank you so much for that. Sounds like these guys are out of Canada. Um, there are guys 
that go through ski rubbers a lot. Um, and so if you were gonna change these out and go into an aftermarket one, we're gonna go ahead and, and swap these out and give them a try. Looks like that that sits right down in the saddle. Something I would tell you about ski rubbers is visual inspection from the side. You can't really get an idea if that thing is fatigued, if it's cracked right down the center. And those of you that are watching this smiling about a ski rubber kind of ruining your day, and you'll hear me talk about it in some other videos of this thing being 15 bucks, carrying a spare with you is pretty damn important. If it's not for you, it's for the guy that you're riding with. And if he tries to ride out without that and or something underneath there that's gonna help that ski and keep its form as it's up in the air, man, when a ski doesn't have that ski rubber and it dips down, you just made a $15 part turn into potential injury and then maybe a lot of other damage to the snowmobile because you either elected to ride and I've seen it before you put it in the comments of, this, of the rope back to here to try to keep it together. All of those things are fantastic. Whether or not that's your day and now you're going home, um, I would tell you that just having the spare and or going into something sort of aftermarket that's got a bit more life to it. Uh, visual inspection, not gonna cut it. Need to pull the bolt and look at it. So that's what we're gonna do. All right, so you've got your factory ski rubber, which again, you know, whether or not that's reason for concern, I'm gonna go ahead and change them out anyway, just so I can test these. You guys can see the amount of surface area and something that I would tell you as a consideration is, you guys can see here on my spindle, how I've got my bushings on either side. So I like my ski stance set up basically at that, that 36 inch from center to center. Know that you can, when you make those swaps and you put this on one side or the other, I would tell you that the surface area of a wider ski rubber allows that thing to have a bit more purchase on there Typically, when you do that with the factory one, you're kind of half on or half off the spindle, and I'd see that you'd see a lot more wear of your ski rubbers based on that. Okay, got our new one. Got directional arrows from this BWC Power Sports, and they're gonna just set right down in there. You can tell that that fit looks really, really good. And we'll bring that thing under. Just like that. So we've, we've kind of wrapped up the front end as a reminder in terms of fluid top off. We've talked about putting our oil into the reservoir, cleaning up this. I would also take a peek at our coolant bottle, making sure that that's up to the line that it's supposed to be at, making sure that the lid hasn't gone through some sort of damage and it's ready to pop off there as well. So even though we didn't film that, just know that we're gonna check and, and you know, fill up fluids and go through the whole front of it. Moving back, the controls, these are these things that are, I mean, they're out in the open, we see them, we know about them, whether it's just checking our, our brake levers, our grips for its condition, um, moving underneath here into the controls, a lot of guys using the Polaris tether, and I am as well, just making sure that the clips in and around the tether, you guys will see from another video about carrying a spare tether, knowing that if either of these break off, the way it seats onto there, might not work as well. So good inspection of that. Your controls know that at times the backside of your bright, bright light switch as well as your hand warmer switch can wiggle themselves loose. Pulling the gas cap off and exposing the back of this panel is a great way to see if those connectors are intact. So that's that. Then overall just visual inspection of your bars, your throttle, your brake, your perk switch, your kill switch, all your wires are routed properly handlebars being tight. How many guys I've seen out there kicking their handlebars or moving them just because they did not either A, have the wrenches to make that, make that adjustment then and or they just didn't get it tight enough or maybe it didn't even come tight enough from the dealer having those tools and we could get into all kinds of tools. You guys will see the tool list in a different video in terms of what tools necessary to adjust your handlebars, not just at the post, but basically everything. And there's, there's quite a few specific tools for that. All right, on this side of the slide, you guys see I have my MVM Motorsports kind of next level edition throttle block. There's quite a few different companies out there kind of doing something similar. Um, the Polaris throttle, we, we know we've seen, especially on those deep, deep days, we've had some struggles with it. Um, I'd say that that's a work in progress and something like this going into the aftermarket, I've seen some, some changes and feel like that's a, a step in the right direction. Um, anyway, it's, it's good maintenance in terms of uh, a checkup, 
just to make sure that our throttles are intact. Our TPS is still allowed to engage uh, the throttle cable in itself. There is some maintenance to that, especially as you are giving it throttle without it running and you were feeling any kind of indicator that there was maybe something in the line um, that was holding it up, something like that. So throttles would be a, a, a really big thing to continually look at. I wouldn't just use that as a mid-season checkup um, and know that we're making as many, there's a lot of effort being put into the throttle blocks themselves. And I would say that um, we're addressing that and whether that's through the OEM or through the aftermarket um, and know that this is a big one in terms of let's continually check our throttles. All right, so moving back on to the snowmobile, the suspension uh, and the track, you guys gotta know like just the hell that this part of the snowmobile is, is in. Um, and in order for it to stay uh, performing the way we want it to, it's important that we inspect it, we clean it, we look for signs of wear and tear or fatigue. Uh, we can grease the skid. I don't have my grease gun with me, um, but using um, a, a grease, a solid, you know, all season or all terrain type of a grease. Uh, you can see the grease circs that are here on your front and rear control arms. I would say that you're continually going to check that stuff, but know that it's not magic. And that if you're not the guy that sends your sled into the dealer every time that there's an issue and you're kind of depending on them to do it, this is stuff that is kind of left up to us. And as part of a mid-season checkup, I would certainly tell you that we should grease the skid and just follow, um, follow somewhat of a strict schedule in terms of how we're gonna, you know, take care of our machines. Beyond that, uh, you guys see I have my cool little torch here. I love having props like this. Um, but I'm using that to, you can see the hairs off the side of the track. There is nothing wrong with taking this and cleaning up those hairs. And when you get one that's big enough, sometimes you'll catch the, the track on fire and you get the smell burnt rubber. But anyway, just doing something simple like that. And while you're doing that, because you are kind of paying close attention to what it is that you're doing there with the torch, you can be mindful of the, you know, the nubs, the ribs, the, the metal components of your track. You're looking for obviously torn paddles, any kind of a tear in a track. Um, those are for sure reasons for concern, knowing that you're going to be way back in the backcountry and you have a failure with the track. Um, that's a pretty tough one and it's one that you got to be way ahead of. So inspecting of your tracks, so many of us are rolling sleds over and what a great opportunity while the sled is rolled over to just take 30 seconds and look to see if you've got any kind of issues with your sled. While you're in the shop, you can use a torch, you can clean things up and you can take a closer eye on all things underneath here and into the rear skid. All right, so kind of the same that we did with the front suspension. I am just taking a paper towel, kind of looking for to see if there's any seals broke. I think there'd be some pretty obvious uh, marks on the paper towel if we did have an issue there. The shocks are relatively new, but it doesn't uh, hurt at any time to come under here and again, look for any signs of fatiguing or cracking. It looks like the mounts are all good. The upper nut and bolt, I can tell, are there and are seated. Most of this stuff that's in here, guys, is a nylock, um, but it doesn't mean that snowmobiles can and don't rattle themselves to pieces. So again, when you've got good light, you're not out in the freezing cold, it's important to come through and just visual inspection of that. And then again, uh, you'll wanna unweight the suspension with an air shock um, and go ahead and make those changes as need be, which I've already done. Um, tech tip for those that are I guess maybe struggling about air suspension. This skid and these rear shocks are actually from my guide sled from last season. Pulled the skid, the shocks, basically had a complete setup with the Ibex scratches and everything ready to go into my guide sled for this year. And after I put it in, went ahead and thought, well, it's been an entire summer of the sleds or the skid sitting inside of a storage unit. I'll go ahead and check my air pressure. And for those that think that air pressure fluctuates, it was dead on from the EVOL to the main chamber, both front and rear track shock was exactly to spec, which I think is pretty damn awesome. Um, and so anyway, I went ahead and checked that. And again, as part of a checkup throughout the middle of my season, if you did have any issues or you felt the sled, maybe some changes in the way the sled's performance was, I would immediately unweight the machine and check my air pressure both all, all the way around. All right, so we're, we're nearing the tail end of the sled here, guys. Um, we can't say enough about track tension, and I'd also say that when we're 
talking about all things rear suspension related, it's important to look at your high facts and that life as well. Pretty simple. They've got a guideline that's here on the high facts itself. We'll show a, a zoomed in shot of that of about when it's time, but you can also tip the sled on its side and just visual inspection of the bottom of your high faxes. Um, <clears throat> again, turning an okay day into a great one. This is a relatively inexpensive part and you can actually take the high faxes out without pulling your skid through the windows in the track and that'd be another video. And there's probably something that's out there. Anyway, track tension, this is an ice age setup. So the, the rear axle bolt is slightly different from factory, um, but it would be important again in your toolkit. Um, this is something that is so much easier to do in a shop than in the backcountry, And I get it. The rule of thumb for me is I want to run my track relatively loose. I don't want to feel like I am being held back because I've got my track tension so tight. But we also have to keep in mind that when we do have a loose track and we can start to feel or hear that ratcheting, we're being really hard on the windows of our track. And over time that can cause some pretty major damage. And when you're in the backcountry and you're having a, you're trying to have a rad day, you got snow caked in and around all of this equipment here, it's pretty dang difficult to get in there, chip ice away. Most of the time you're chipping into your powder coat and you're messing things up back here when you could have just made those adjustments as part of your regular checkup. So on this setup guys, um, I'll need a 15 and that will go ahead and loosen up the rear axle bolt. And then this stays the same. So this is still factory. You'll need a 16 that you can reach in and get onto that jam nut. And then it's nice to have and put in your kit a 10 millimeter, but actually have it be a ratchet wrench. And that's really nice for being able to either, you know, add tension or take uh, tension away. So just some simple things to keep into your kit. I wouldn't ever assume that the, that the OEM has this stuff provided, nor would I assume that your buddy does. So pretty dang simple, pretty inexpensive for you to have these two, these three items to be able to adjust track tension. Okay, well, beyond just another visual inspection of the back, a big thorough cleaning, making sure that you're not seeing any kind of kinking, any kind of, you know, screwed up area to the tail end of the snowmobile, which can and has happened, guys. It's just part of it. And when you ride hard, um, it's important that you go through and you inspect your snowmobile. That's way, that way, every time you go out, you're going to, again, you're going to have an awesome day instead of an okay one. Um, as an overview, I've got some cleaners here, some simple green. I do have some brake cleaner. Um, Arctic effects with their wrap material. They make adhesive remover, they make cleaners, they make all kinds of stuff. This is not a bad one in terms of being able to just keep the, the wrap clean. I've also got a protective coating spray from Torco, which I like uh, being able to clean off the wraps and things like that. Um, and then beyond that, I've got some all-purpose cleaner that I get from Polaris in terms of shop spills and just things like that to just keep your shop area cleaned up. You could also use it for underneath the belly pan and just areas like that. Um, but yeah, some very simple tools um, to just go through your snowmobile and make sure that that thing is running tip top. And it's not OEM specific, right? It's, it's literally every snowmobile that's out there, regardless of its age, you know, all of these things at one time looked and ran really, really well. And it's our job as we're riding it to take care of it. And to, if we want that top performance out of it, it's important that we go through and we spend the time and make that thing as good a running machine as it can. So. You guys leave those questions and comments below. We appreciate all of that, all of the feedback that we continue to get. Remember to subscribe and we'll see you next time.